Good morning and uh, welcome to today's seminar which is on the difficult but vital subject of broken relationships. Before I introduce our speaker, I just need to say that um, if you've been coming to the seminar, this particular seminar track so far, I'm sorry to have to tell you that tomorrow's seminar uh, with Ephraim Buckle is cancelled because Ephraim is stuck in London uh, with a bug, not coronavirus, uh, but he's not very well, so he's not able to come. So don't come to this session tomorrow morning. But I'm glad you've come today, and I'm very <laughs> pleased to introduce to you Dr. Oh. Sonia Crossley. <laughs> Uh, Sonia, you've come up with Jim, your husband, from where? We've come from Sheffield. Um, I don't get called doctor very much anymore, because although I am medically trained, I haven't worked as a, don a doctor for donkey's years now. So don't come to me and ask me about anything medical. I'll lead you astray. Um, you're um, uh, involved in, um, in, a, in a church in North Sheffield, where yeah. Jim is the curate, but he's also a medic. Yes. You've got four kids. Yep and some good family news this summer? Yes, our son is marrying Gareth and Claire's daughter who are over there in the crowd there. Woo -hoo! So we're hoping, Lord willing, COVID abating, we will have a big jamboree Lovely. in a few weeks time. Lovely. In terms of your um, uh, experience in the area we're going to be talking about today, uh, you've been doing some work as a biblical counselor for some time. Could you just mention what, what that is? Yes, um, biblical counseling, it might be a new idea for some of you. Some of you will have experienced that or got familiar with what that's all about. The basic premise of biblical counseling is um, trying to connect the true things we know about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with the everyday nitty gritty situations we all find ourselves in where we wonder, how's this gonna make a difference right here on the ground? So. Um, that's a wonderful thing to explore, to be trained in, and to help other people get involved with. Well, thank you so much for coming. Can I open this uh, in uh, with a prayer? Our Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to consider this difficult but so important matter of broken relationships. Thank you for bringing uh, Sonia to speak to us on this subject today. Grant to her, we pray, great wisdom and to, to help us to see what's there in your word about this. And we pray that you'd use today for the mending of broken relationships. Bless us all with great uh, understanding as a result of this morning's session, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Over to Sonia, who's going to speak for a while, and then there will be a little opportunity for questions at the end. I hope so. I have a habit of overrunning, because I always want to say more than I should. So sorry about that if that happens, but let's hope it doesn't. Um, broken relationships, that's what we're here to think about this morning. Um, we're going to spend the first half of our time thinking about the sort of how and why of our relational breakdowns. And then the second half, I think I might have gone off on the microphone, second half, looking at what we can actually do about it. Um, I'm guessing that for some here this morning, this might be a pretty raw topic. Right now, perhaps you are in the midst of some kind of relational turmoil and it's um, causing you confusion and hurt in your own life. And what, what I want to say to you at the start of this is you are not alone. Um, you know, we've talked about some of my experience, but I think the only thing that actually qualifies me to stand here and speak about this this morning is I too have broken relationships in my past. And some of the very issues we're going to be grappling with this morning are things I'm trying to work out in at least one fairly disrupted relationship in my own life. So we are in this together. That's the message this morning. And while I'm about it, so is the person next to you. Just take a look at them. Look them in the eyeball. Because here's my first headline this morning. With the only exception of Jesus himself, to some degree or other, we all have broken relationships somewhere in our story. That might be some sort of monumental fracture that changes life forever, or it might just be a relationship where trust and transparency are even just vaguely disrupted. 
And it's no worth noting as we start that even if we might think we're not getting anything particularly wrong in our dealings with others, doesn't mean we aren't. So that's one of the things we're going to explore this morning. So if you're here this morning because you kind of come thinking, I've got somebody else's broken relationship in my mind, put that one down. And can I ask you to begin with yourself this morning? However conflict avoidant you are as a personality, and let's face it, quite a lot of us are, and however peaceful your own life might feel right now, I'm going to broaden our definition of what makes a broken relationship until it includes yours, because it does. You see, this isn't just about the extreme stuff. Broken relationships come in a whole range of shapes and sizes, and it's really not as black and white as we like to think. Broken relationships, you see, are not just the sudden, big, heated public dramas. You know the ones, everyone except the actual people involved love to talk about it. Um, the teenager who storms out behind the slamming door, the messy divorce down the road, the raised voices or fists at the last family gathering, the lawsuit at work, or even perhaps that shocking and toxic church split. No, relationships can break just as easily in really cold, slow, small steps over a long time. There's no actual confrontation or real conflict, just a steady erosion of trust. They can break down in quiet ways with no more than a whisper, a dismissive look or a really clumsy email. Which of us hasn't received one of those or perhaps sent one in the last few weeks? Um, they can break in hidden ways too that no one else outside of the relationship would ever see or know about. There may be some lie or a secret at the middle of it all. Perhaps there's the threatening manipulation of some kind of abuse in there. And it's also pretty common in my experience that relationships between two people can be utterly broken, but actually only one person is aware of it. And then on top of that range, we've got the whole variety of triggers. So I'll just run through those. I can do something that hurts you. You can do something that hurts me. Often there's a deliberate act of hostility, but other times it's more subtle. There's an unfortunate accident or a mistake. It was no one's fault. It was never intended to divide, but it has. Sometimes there's a tragic misunderstanding in there. Wrong assumptions are made, wrong conclusions are drawn, and things never get ironed out. Or perhaps it's just that simple bog-standard difference of opinion over something that matters hugely to one party, but it's so important to them that they can't tolerate anyone who takes a contrary view. That's how broken relationships come about. And if we're honest, put like that, we know no one is really immune or exempt. And God in his word couldn't be any clearer. Scripture sets it out like this. Between the bookends of the perfect unity and peace in the Garden of Eden in Genesis and the everlasting peace in the throne room of heaven in Revelation, what's in between? It's the darkness and the chaos of sin. It is ever present. And what does sin do? Sin chips away at my unity with God and it chips away at my unity with you. Sin's MO is to fracture relationships wherever it can. So while sin remains, even for us Christians, broken relationships are going to be a fact of life. And we have a God who's giving us the heads up and tells us, expect it. Um, in an hour, I can't cover everything about broken relationships. So what I want to do is to focus in on one particular sort of broken relationship this morning. And I think it's the one that perhaps God in his word makes it most clear that we as Christians should be expecting. It is going to be part of each of our stories. So for that reason, we're going to look at it. But also, I think it's the one that perhaps gets us most confused. 
And it's the particular variety of broken relationships where you have been wronged by somebody else where you have been wronged by somebody else. And rather than offering you a case study from my life or my ministry this morning, the case study this morning is actually going to be you, each one of you. You don't have to share it with anyone else, but I want you to have your own relationships in your mind as we walk through this, this, this material. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment here, just while you perhaps think about a situation that you want to examine. It might be um, a big thing, it might be a small thing, it could be current or past. Just make a mo mental note of it. The harm caused to you might be physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, psychological or spiritual. Perhaps it's even harder for you. You were wronged by someone who should have been kind. A friend turned enemy-like. They were supposed to be out for your good. You trusted them and they let you down or betrayed you in some way. Perhaps it was just a one-off event or maybe it's gone on for years and years and years and the hurt keeps coming. Some of us, that situation will be all too obvious this morning. But others of us might be struggling to think of something here. Perhaps you don't think of yourself as someone who has been wronged. Well, maybe you have largely dealt with, that, dealt with that. But maybe it's a much smaller incident for you. A sharp word. A criticism. Being misrepresented in gossip or being overlooked or somehow excluded from something. And if you really still can't think of anything, just think about the last time you felt angry. Angry, isolated, or upset. Even if it was just on the inside, what was it about? And I'm just going to give you a moment, and then I'm going to pray for us, because uh, it's difficult stuff to wade through this morning. So have a think, and then I'll pray. Our Lord God, these are hard things for us to think through this morning, and yet we know you are good and kind. Um, as we each in this room bring a situation of our own under the spotlight, please would you help us, not just to um, better understand how our relationships can go wrong so easily, but would we each get a taste for just how rich and powerful your gospel is, able to transform our most disrupted and dysfunctional into personal messes that we find ourselves in. Would you give each individual here wisdom and hope, all that they need to perhaps take one constructive step forward that might um, do good and bring you glory in Jesus' name. So where am I heading with all this? In under 10 minutes, I've managed to um, unsettle a whole room of fairly relaxed holiday makers, I think. Uh, I've told you not only that you have broken relationships in your story, but I've also then got you to dredge up some of the particulars that will be painful, painful memories of when you have been hurt by someone close to you. And I am sorry to do this, but let me reassure you we're heading somewhere good this morning. Um, but first, we need to just think a little bit more about sin, because I'm convinced that if we really understand sin, Rather than being surprised that broken relationships keep cropping up amongst us, I think we should actually be pretty, pretty astonished that there aren't a whole lot more. And here's the Bible verse that's going to orientate us for the rest of our time this morning. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 15. Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. I don't know what your definition of sin is, but this is a pretty good one that takes us straight to the heart of the problem. Sin is much deeper than just the wrong things I think, say, or do. The underlying issue that our gospel of grace is rescuing us from is this heart attitude. It's living for themselves. Did you spot it there? That living for themselves attitude is what motors with sin. Sin makes me fundamentally selfish. It places me in the middle of my own 
self-absorbed little kingdom where I am so preoccupied with my concerns, my needs, my wants, that I live basically lights out to God up there as if he's not there, and I simply don't have the bandwidth to consider you as someone I should be loving and serving because I'm too busy doing that for myself. There's a self-obsession to sin that actually dehumanizes those around us. It's pretty serious stuff. So to quote Paul Tripp, you become no more to me than either a vehicle to me getting what I want, in which case I like you and we can get on, or you are going to be an obstacle to me getting, getting what I want, in which case you're going to frustrate me and I don't actually want to be in a relationship with you particularly. And when you boil it down, isn't that how most broken relationships start? And not surprisingly, it's the reason why most broken relationships never get fixed. But in the particular situation we are focusing on right now, this is tricky, isn't it? Because when someone has wronged us, so often we get really black and white about it, don't we? The sin of the one who has offended us is surely what's on the table. It's their selfishness, their living for themselves attitude that's made the mess. Theirs is the real problem here, isn't it? Well, yes, whilst that's true for them, it's only half the story. Because what we love to ignore is the fact that even though it's true, you are the victim of somebody else's wrongdoing, you too have all the same heart issues motoring under the surface inside you because Here's our second big headline for this morning. It's not that you have been wronged that is actually the key issue. God, remember, has told us to expect that. The real issue is how are you going to respond? A broken relationship is never just about the one person or the one event even that broke it in the first place but it's about each and every response and counter-response thereafter. Certainly something I'm learning in my own life. And what really unsettles me, and I think should unsettle all of us, is that faced with the hurt and injustice of being wronged, supposedly, Jesus-loving, grace-filled Christians like you and me, often without realizing it, shrink back and we revert to this living for ourselves mentality. And it becomes our lifestyle as we try to respond. All too quickly, one person wronging another has become two people wronging one another, each laying the blame at the other's door. Friends, we are those who have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus for that other way of life for living for him. We should be looking up to God in dependent faith and out to others in sacrificial love. And instead, we find ourselves shrunk down, bitter, stuck, and disorientated. Paul Tripp puts it like this. I think there are many Christians living in Christless relationships. Without knowing what they have done, they have constructed law-based rather than grace-based relationships. And because of this, they are asking the law to do what only really grace can accomplish. It's a great quote. I think if you take nothing away from this morning other than that quote, uh, mull that one over for a while. It's precious stuff. So what does living for self actually look like then? The bad news, what does it look like when we respond out of this living for self attitude to being hurt? Well, we go on autopilot, in my experience, and we have one of three or possibly four options. But these first three that we're going to look at now are all catastrophic because they do absolutely nothing to heal the rift. We can become peace breakers peace fakers, or peace forsakers. And as we go through, you'll probably spot which one tends to be you. 
Um, I've borrowed the first two unashamedly from Ken Sandy's peacemaking material, which is well worth a look if you, if you want to explore this, this stuff further. But um, the other two are my own, so you can borrow them if you like. Um, so when you wrong me in some way, the peace between us has been broken. Let's not pretend. But I can become first another peace breaker like you. What does that look like? I will return evil for evil. I retaliate. I fight back. Blame, judge. I will exaggerate your wrong as I tell others about it. I will totally vindicate myself and will assume the role of the innocent victim. I get to dictate what it's going to take for you to put things right. And I will wait for you to come to me to fix things. You see how that reinforces the break. But some of us don't like that level of confrontation, do we? Especially us Christians. And uh, we like life to stay calm and feel under control. We hate either having to hear or say difficult things. We'd rather go down the more composed route of the peace faker. This is when we know we're at odds. We're feeling all the tension and hostility under the surface. But we're either too proud or too scared to admit it. And rather than surface the mess, we find pretty sophisticated ways of hiding it all. Small talk and smiles keep a lot of this mess hidden, don't they? We can excuse, we can justify, we can distract ourselves. Or sometimes we can even choose to minimize the wrong that has been done to us so that we don't have to engage with the pain. Christians so often go down this route, and I think about the young couple in a friend's church who, rather than admitting their marriage had fallen apart and asking for help, they decided instead to spend thousands of pounds building a stud wall down the middle of their semi-detached house. This is true, apparently. Um, they'd got this wall built, and behind their front door, in front of the front door, everything looked fine, opened the front door, two routes so that they could live under the same roof, but have entirely separate lives. They didn't need to have anything else to do with each other now. And to all intents and purposes, as they came out of the front door, everything was fine. Nobody knew. And behind the door, totally separate. That's a pretty extreme example. But peace faking goes on in our churches all the time. We value things looking neat and calm, at least from the front on a Sunday morning. We won't revisit that difficult conversation over there, and we won't concern ourselves with that sin pattern over there. Relationships are breaking, but it suits us better in church to pretend to ourselves and each other that they aren't. Or we say that we are communities of grace and forgiveness. How we love to talk about that. But we never actually confess the specifics of what we're asking each other to forgive each other for. And if we try and apologize, I think, I don't know about you, but I think I might actually have an allergy to saying sorry. Um, it just seems to be something that is too difficult to own what I've done. And I think in churches we see that. We try and apologize, and our apologies fall so far short of healing. They can actually make things worse. They're so generic or unspecific or so full of ifs and buts that you come away from this apology thinking, I'm not actually sure what you even were telling me you'd done. But anyway, I feel like we're supposed to be in a better place, so let's just muddle along. Um, that's peace faking. And then there's the last resort, peace forsaking. This is when you just walk away. You just simply give up. You've had enough. It's too stressful. It's too messy. It's too complicated. You've got other things to get on with. And so you actively decide to remove yourself or eliminate this problematic relationship from your life. You move away. You get a different job. You unfriend them on Facebook. You avoid having to sit next to them, chat to them, be in the same home group as them, whatever it takes. You just think, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm done. Or we just go for that slightly subtler version of this where you just tolerate 
each other being around, but you have no intention of going deeper in relationships. And we do this all the while convincing ourselves it's their fault it's got to this. And that is how broken relationships are going to stay broken. So just take a moment now to think about that relational hurt you identified earlier on. Consider your most recent interaction with that person. There will be plenty of ways you were perhaps very deeply wronged by this other person, but just shine the spotlight in the other direction for a moment here and ask yourself, are there any ways I can see that I might have adopted a peace-breaking, faking or forsaking response? I'll just give you a moment to have a think about that. So um, where are we up to? Here's our third headline. Sinners tend to respond to sin sinfully. I'll say that again. Sinners tend to respond to sin sinfully. And here's the thing. Before you knew Christ, living for self, that peace-breaking, faking, and forsaking were your only options. You were hardwired to pursue self-protection and self-interest. And when it comes to attempting to fix things in that living for self mindset, a fourth category emerges, which is perhaps the most tragic of them all, the one I like to call the peace broker. And it's tragic because it sort of works. It's a kind of plausible way of sorting things out. It's basically a patch up. What does it look like then? And I see this all the time in Christian circles. I see it in parenting and marriages all the time. I know I've done it myself hundreds of times. It goes like this. Um, we think restoration is going to come by being fair. That's what we're going to do. Through good listening, sharp negotiation skills, and finding some kind of compromise, we're going to make sure that the solution is somehow going to suit both parties here. Both parties' agendas and wishes will be met, and there's going to be some sort of sense of justice that we can appeal to that's going to be satisfied on both sides of this. You wronged me in this way, so it's only understandable that I retaliated in that way. We're quits. Or now we're beginning to work this through, you're going to sacrifice this thing. It's only expected then that the other party's going to have to give up that thing. Therefore, we're quits. We're done. That's all good, isn't it? Peace brokering like this can often feel quite effective. It actually does work in the short term. I think about it with my children when they were toddlers. This was quite a good outcome for me as a parent. I thought, we've, we've cracked this. But it is woefully superficial. It rarely brings about the deep, lasting unity we all crave. Because if you think about it, Notice how it leaves both parties still entirely comfortable with continuing to live for themselves. And that was the problem in the first place. We've just allowed it to carry on again. But here's the good news this morning. God, in his goodness, offers each of us as his children an alternative, a fork in the road. If only we'd slow down long enough to consider it, it is there he invites us to go forwards in a totally new and different direction, down the track, signed reconciliation. And I deliberately call it a track because true reconciliation, as I'm sure many of you will know, is never just a one-off event. It's a journey. It's slow. It's always messy on the way. You might not get very far down this track called reconciliation, but it is always worth exploring. And if you are blessed enough to reach the destination, you and potentially the one who has wronged you will be changed for life. Lights on to God and with him as our guide, we can begin to learn to respond to being wronged 
as those living for him who died for us and was raised. It's back to that verse in 2 Corinthians 5. Following in the footsteps of the one true peacemaker. So we're going to spend the rest of our time just taking a stroll together down that track called reconciliation. You'll need to bring the mess of that disrupted relationship you've thought of with you. And perhaps I'm going to go through a few lists of things that might sound a bit sort of a rush, but just pick out anything that strikes you that might be relevant to your situation and then spend time later working through the lists that are, that are there in the handout for you to look at if you want to. Um, I'm going to whiz through it pretty quickly, but um, as we get started, let's get our metaphorical walking boots on and see what this journey is all about. Um, just to give you the heads up, there are going to be three phases to this journey. You've got to do them in the right order, and there are no shortcuts. So having been hurt, going God's way, choosing to live for him, we're going to go slowly for a start. We're going to look up, and then we're going to look in, and then, and only then, are we going to look out. So the first leg of the walk is looking up, reminding ourselves of who God is and what he's done. So here are just a few things that you might want to take note of. He's here and he's triune. I mean, it sounds obvious, doesn't it? But if you're anything like me, I'm not thinking about that when you upset me. God's gone. All I see is you. How refreshing it is just to stop us in our tracks and be forced to look up and be reminded someone bigger and better than either of us is here. He's on sight. What a relief. And he's triune, which means that three in one, God is existing within himself in total peace and unity and mutual affection. He really is the relational expert that's on site with us here. It is such a comfort, it gives us hope. What else might we remember? We live in his story now. God's story is bigger and better than any of ours. The theme of God's story is one massive move from brokenness to reconciliation. In fact, you could say the whole of salvation history is just one cosmic act of reconciliation. My story is now nestled somewhere in his. And so here's the point. If the trajectory of God's journey is this move from brokenness to reconciliation, there's a kind of grain to it. And I look at my relationships and I think, are my relationships going with the grain or am I pulling against it? Am I somehow out of sync with what God's up to? It can really help us to stand back and get that big picture back in place. God's not surprised to see us in our mess. He is more than just expecting it. God in his sovereignty has deliberately planned this particular mess to be in your life right now because he promises to be up to something, up to something good in you. What might that be? Um, I've got a few purposes I've been rummaging around in my head with over the last few days. One of the most striking ones, Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's a staggering verse, that, if you think about it. How you respond and treat someone who has wronged you is perhaps the litmus test of who you belong to. Are you God's or are you your own? God is watching. He's presenting you with a fork in the road. Which way are you going to go? Are you someone who returns evil for evil, hopelessly overcome by sin? Or are you able to be someone who can return good for evil because you have the Lord Jesus? If you haven't got him, you can't do it. Perhaps this relational difficulty is giving you a reason you've never had before to run to God for refuge and for comfort, to deepen your relationship with him. 
Perhaps it's to purify your faith in some other way. Maybe God is equipping you to become someone who's going to be able to comfort others in their relational difficulty. Maybe the way you resolve this relationship is going to be a witness to others who still don't know Jesus. So many things God might be up to. James 4.12 says God alone is judge. That's a really important bit of the jigsaw to have in place. Not me. It's his to avenge, Romans 12.9. I often say in counseling, have you got to the stage yet where you have let them off your hook, knowing that you leave them on God's? It's a good question. We're not saying we're supposed to be a pushover here or a doormat. (laughs) It doesn't mean pretending everything's fine. It's simply saying, I don't need a certain outcome here. You're off my hook. But we have the comfort that we know the really just judge of the universe has them under his eye. Jesus is the true peacemaker. That helps, doesn't it? It helps us to recognize that without him, I can't actually do very much that's going to be useful here. And we revisit the gospel. What do we discover? Our gospel that brings us to Jesus is outrageously unfair. We no longer live under law, but grace. Think about how Christ is with you. Romans 5, 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There is an innocent one who has never done anything wrong, who takes the initiative in reconciliation with us, the wrongdoer. He pays the debt I owe. He keeps pursuing me with fresh grace every day. He is faithful when I can't be. Will I trust him to do good here? Perhaps sometimes we just need to hear God's promise to be with us. He's going to be with us and he promises to never leave or forsake you. This is the one relationship in the whole universe that is unbreakable. And united with Christ, with his spirit at work in me, hope can be reignited because he has promised to resource me with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead to be a peacemaker like him in the situation in front of me. What might that look like? That's leg one of our journey. And I'm going to give you just a pause at the moment. I'm not sure how COVID secure this is, but I'm going to ask you just to, through your masks maybe, just mention to the person next to you one thing about God or the gospel that has struck you as we've been thinking about it then that you'd perhaps forgotten that might make a difference to you. Just give you a moment to do that. Okay, Um, once you've done that work of looking up, it doesn't take long before we realize, does it, that whatever the brokenness looks like in the horizontal relationships we have right now, we're beginning to understand it's actually the vertical one that needs my attention first. That there are actually things between me and God that need repairing and sorting out. Reconciliation begins with me and God first. And that's where this second section of the journey goes. We're going to be looking in. It's a bit more uncomfortable. You have to look at the ugliness. But you want to ask God to help you see what he sees when he looks inside you. And this is a really helpful process to go in. I'm not going to go into it now. Just a couple of things. Don't bypass the pain. We have a God who wants to comfort you and look after you in the hurt and pain. I think Christians often feel like, We're failing if we're upset. (laughs) Um, 
if that's the case, I'm done, certainly, and I'm sure most of you are. But we have a God who wants to hear us pour ourselves out to him. He is our comfort and refuge. Take him at his word. Spend time with him, weeping, if that's what it takes. This is real. Then let him examine you deep down. A passage like James 4 is so helpful and incisive in helping us uncover some of the things that are motoring under the surface when we're hurt. Heart issues, agendas, motivations and desires that are actually going full throttle in us when we're hurt. And God wants us to surface them. What outcome might you be after here that you're perhaps clinging on to too tightly? What are your reasons for still trying to be the judge here? Is that acceptable? Are you being too prescriptive in what you're after? Go a bit deeper. Ask yourself, why is it I think things should go like this at this point? What is it about this outcome I want so badly? And why? What's under threat? What am I protecting? Has that thing, it might be your reputation, your sense of control, your own self-righteousness, or even an honourable pursuit of justice, just become too important to you? Has it in fact taken God's place at the heart of your story? Because James 4 also teaches us we have a God who is very jealous for that number one spot in our hearts. But we also hear there is grace. There is more grace. God wants to meet us as he uncovers our hearts. If we are willing to be exposed before him and look at some of these agendas and desires that have become uh, demands in our own lives, he wants to help us and minister to us, forgive us and be reconciled with him. So take him at his word. Because if you do business with God, you can place the messed up relationship in his capable hands. And it's really only then that you're ready to approach and consider what you're going to do about this other person who has wronged you. As one loved, forgived, and re- forgiven and reconciled sinner, I'm now ready to hold these things out to someone else, even my enemies. So spend time on your own later doing the self-reflection before God. I won't get you to do that now. It would take too long. But perhaps just make a note of one specific thing you think God might be just nudging you on that he might want to address in your heart, um, even today. But the third leg is really where we just need to spend a bit more time. This is a bit more complex. I'm kind of trying to go and cover difficult issues like forgiveness, reconciliation, repentance, all in about 10 minutes. So it's going to be um, light, and there'll be much more to say and think about it afterwards. But again, the message here is as you turn to face the one who has wronged you and somehow deal with them, don't rush. So often I chat with people in their eagerness to get things sorted who've bypassed steps one and two. They haven't done any looking up. They certainly haven't done any looking in. And they're ready. They're coming for it. It's fairly scary. It doesn't usually work. Um, We know, don't we, that... As Christians, we should be at least at peace with each other. We know that's the goal. We know that reconciliation is what we're aiming for. And we have this vague sense that forgiveness and repentance are in there. But I think we so often reduce these hugely complex issues down to quite a simple formula. Often we don't even think there is a formula. We just think somehow with enough time and water under the bridge, it'll kind of come about naturally. Other times we go... You said you're sorry, great. Have you forgiven them? Great. Uh, I think uh, if you promise not to do that again, brilliant. Let's move on. We can just carry on, can't we? It's not that simple. And I've begun to understand the process of reconciliation can get hijacked at any point along the way. It really can't happen without relating to the other person. Wouldn't it be convenient if our relationships could all be restored by me just going into a quiet room, taking a few deep breaths, and we re-emerge and we're all fine? It's going to involve some kind of confrontation, and that's where I want us to focus on. But first, it's tragic how often we get stuck in limbo at the start here. We're often unsure who's going to make the first move. We're pretty clear on Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5 that if I am the wrongdoer, of course I am the one who should drop everything, even regular religious activities, to go and sort things out with the one I have wronged. 
But what if it's the other way around? They have wronged me. They don't seem to be coming to put things right. They never do. And this is where we struggle. But here's the rub. Jesus also teaches in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, don't wait for him to feel appropriately convicted and come. Jesus tells you, go. Go to him in that situation too. In fact, in every kind of broken relationship, Jesus always calls us as those now living for him to be the ones to be willing always to initiate reconciliation. It sounds outrageously unfair until we remember that's how he deals with us. But there's one caveat before we go on there. Jesus' instruction to go doesn't always mean it's appropriate for me to physically put myself in front of the one who has wronged me. Sometimes that's exactly what it means, and I need a jolly good shove to get on with it. But God also gives, calls us to be wise. We shouldn't just walk straight back into threatening situations or into abusive dynamics where there's been trauma or where manipulative power dynamics are still at play. But nor does that mean that we're off the hook there and we don't need to make any more effort. Instead, we need to think about how we're going to safely, perhaps quite imaginatively, move towards the person who has wronged us without putting ourselves in immediate danger and without giving them further occasion to sin against us. This might mean no further contact. It might mean just significant private processing in your attitude to your wrongdoer perhaps processing it with people you know and trust. It might mean a mediated meeting with others present or a written letter. Establishing boundaries here is not a punitive thing. It can be a positive step towards reconciliation. But while we're on it, there's another point of confusion. Having attempted to go perhaps many times to address things properly, some of us perhaps here this morning would do well to hear Jesus' call on us to stop. As much as I want to get this burden lifted, perhaps my wrongdoer simply isn't either ready or willing. And there are certain situations. We think of the false shepherds. We think of the wolves in sheep's clothing. God calls us to flee from. We're not supposed to be seeking friendship there. We're supposed to be putting the distance in. But sometimes a lack of closure can leave us feeling shortchanged. It keeps us wanting more and frustrated. And I think God does that deliberately to keep us dependent in him on prayer. It reminds us that we're not finally home yet. Don't give up on that relationship, but hold on to the mandate. Your call is still to love that person, even from a distance, even your enemy. And as far as it depends on you to have tried to live at peace. That might not mean a close friendship. But are there perhaps small, significant ways you could simply be kind or bless your enemy in some practical way from a distance? But assuming you go, however you choose to make this move towards them, what are you actually going to do when you get there? What's the content of this interaction? This is where we get unstuck. These are the encounters we dread. And I think we can often become incredibly controlling and prescriptive as the ones who've been wronged. We can arrive in these situations with a sort of set piece. We have a rehearsed script we're going to deliver, and we're quite nervous. We have a vague rebuke, a hint that an apology would be appreciated, and we hold out the vague possibility that perhaps there might be forgiveness from me if you seem to respond in the way that I'm expecting. I think we need to get better at this. There really is such a thing as good and godly confrontation. And we begin by abandoning our fixed agendas for those precious encounters. We go in God's strength, not our own. We get confused about forgiveness. We know we have to forgive, don't we? We know if we don't, God won't. It's that serious. But what is this thing called forgiveness? I want to suggest it's when you can honestly say that the personal cost of the hurt that you have inflicted on me is something I am no longer going to hold against you. The pain and the debt you owe to me 
have been absorbed in my vertical relationship with Jesus. I'll just say that again. Forgiveness is when I can honestly say the personal cost of the hurt you have inflicted on me is something I will no longer hold against you because the pain and the debt you owe have been absorbed in my vertical relationship with Jesus. It's not pretending nothing has happened. It's just saying I am not the one to punish or take personal revenge. Getting to that point is something I can do with God in private. That's an attitudinal forgiveness that I can work out before I have anything to do with you. It's something I can do on my own. And I think this is the sort of non-negotiable bit for us as Christians. We must get to this point. Otherwise, we haven't begun on the journey to reconciliation. But going further may be more complicated. There's so much more to be done if genuine reconciliation is going to be achieved. At some point, we can strive, if at all possible, to let that forgiveness that we've worked, at, we've worked through vertically happen in the horizontal, actually on the ground. We can have a moment where we're going to work hard to get to it, but where we actually are able to communicate, I forgive you, and you accept my offer of forgiveness. That's when true healing and relationships start to feel better on the ground. But sometimes we have to accept that's not going to happen. It doesn't get there often. And I think we often assume we can get there really quickly. But what I want to just talk about for these last few minutes is what I call candid conversation. Because I think in order to get to that starting point of beginning to ease things between us where we have both offered and received forgiveness, it takes time. There's stuff that needs to get sorted out. So candid conversation is real, honest, and two-way. Again, we're not very good at it. We need to take care to lay out the facts of what has actually happened between us. We name the wrongs specifically, clearly, and we clarify what general category of sin those fall into. So, for instance, you said you were going to do X, but then you did Y. You lied to me. So we can do this without twisting or exaggerating, nor do we minimize the wrong that's occurred. We take care not to assume we understand their motives, but we calmly articulate the impact their wrongdoing has had on us. Because you lied to me, it felt like a betrayal, and so now I'm finding it hard to trust you. We're clear. It's not unloving to rebuke like this when genuine wrong has occurred, but we also check ourselves as we go. We can do the log and spec work of Matthew 5, acknowledge there are ways we might have made things worse. We can listen. So often, instead of mediation, oh, sorry, all my things telling me I've run out of time. So often when I'm mediating between people, there's this sort of moment where it's just... Um, got two awkward things haven't been put on the table properly. We haven't actually listened. And then there comes a moment where the wrongdoer explains something of their situation and everything softens. The person who has been wrong said, I never understood that was what you were doing or why you were doing it. The landscape has changed. I love watching Jesus' dealings with difficult relationships in the Gospels. Think about it for a moment. Jesus is not exactly meek and mild. He's calm. He's clear. He reassures but he confronts. He never brushes past issues. He gets the ugly specifics onto the table because he's confident grace is going to stretch further. And he gets people to feel so safe with him that they want to come to him and be forgiven. They receive it and the transaction occurs. Forgiveness like that is beautiful and precious. And there is that one-off event to it but it's also a process that goes on beyond it. And reconciliation has not been achieved just because forgiveness has happened. Reconciliation now is going to happen step by step as you sort of negotiate between you and the party has wrong. What are things going to look like now? We've made that first step to clear the air, but it doesn't mean we just snap back to whatever we had before. The dynamics are different between us. There are scars. Both parties have been fundamentally changed by both the hurt and the healing. We're in a different world now as we emerge from this moment of forgiveness. 
And I think sometimes we can be really prescriptive and clumsy with each other as we kind of expect people to get back to, you know, bosom buddies or whatever it was they had before. And so often it's not like that. We need to be careful with people that there are new, new ways of relating each to each other that are still loving, still us living at peace. But it's really only now, once we've done that forgiveness work, that we can look for signs of repentance in the one who has wronged us. It's not a condition on us doing that forgiveness. It is a condition on us working out how to regain trust and rebuild the relationship. And um, we need to take care as we do that. But if our motivation for pursuing restoration like this is love, we're on a winning ticket here. How are we going to be the ones who can model the faithfulness we know in Christ's dealings with us to the one who has wronged us? How can we help people feel safe enough with us to want to go there? Things like not gossiping behind their backs, speaking accurately and and fairly, showing compassion and listening well. Have we forgiven them in that attitudinal sense, really? Because now our interaction with them has that bit of baggage out of the way and there's a safety in what we're doing with each other that can help us um, move towards each other in new ways. Things can go wrong all the time. Let's not pretend it always goes this smoothly. If we follow all these steps, it it goes well. We can hit walls of despair everywhere along this path called reconciliation. The blocks can occur just at the point where you find it too hard to do that attitudinal forgiveness. There can be a block as you try and get to that point of transaction. And there can certainly be bumps in the road as we work out, is there genuine repentance here? Can we trust each other again? What's this new relationship going to look like? But here's a point. I think God sometimes chooses to keep us in those messy times because he's actually up to something good that's keeping us dependent on him. So let's not miss it. Um, So I think that's... Oh, my one last point, involve others. This is the bit I missed out today. Just, we hate to do this in front of others, don't we? We hate to kind of show people we're making a hash of things. The complexity, so often I think we find ourselves trying to work it all out on our own. Involve others at any stage along this process that you can. Ask those who can see your broken relationship far more objectively than you to pray for you, to walk alongside you, to give you advice, to keep you accountable as you pursue that path of peace. Um, There's a task for you to do on your own. Perhaps think of one constructive step you might take in your relationship that might help bring this dynamic of grace down into your own relationship. Um, There's a quote on the screen there, I think sums up everything I've said. So take that one in and I'll just pray for us as we close and then maybe there'll be some questions I'm not sure how much time we've got but let me pray Uh, our Lord and God um, we've raced through a lot of material that's hard and painful and I pray for each person here this morning that having taken a look at the difficulties and brokenness in our relationships would you help us replace a confidence in ourselves or a confidence in finding justice with a far deeper confidence in the heart-transforming grace of Jesus who has drawn us to himself. We know he alone has the power to draw us to each other and bring healing. Would we see our relationships, however complex, no longer as hassles or obstacles to be tolerated, but as significant opportunities to know more of your grace in our lives and perhaps to be able to show that to others. In Jesus' name, amen. (laughs) Sonia thank you very much we've got time for uh, we've got four minutes for questions uh, three (laughs) minutes for questions that's about two questions I think I kind of aimed for that so uh, uh, if you put your hand up please and then um, Sonia will speak the question and she will repeat it into her own microphone for the recording so a question Yes. 
Wow. Uh, it could repeat be a question. Sorry? Yeah, I will repeat the question. So um, the question was, church splits, um, are they always the wrong outcome? Is that always a disaster? And in the light of that, the second part was, how um, bad is it if a lot of people within the church haven't got a clue there's actually all of that going on? Is that right? Yes. Um, this side of heaven, it never works out brilliantly. I don't think we get to complete reconciliation as it's going to be in its all, all its perfection and glory. Um, I think, yes, sometimes, and this is not just true of church splits, but all of our relationships, sometimes there is a wisdom in actually parting ways and agreeing to differ and more because the peace of that is more healthy than the constant um, you know, conflict that's going on on site. I don't think there's a sort of blanket rule for that. I think you'd have to get really involved into this in the specifics of each um, church's situation. And I think in terms of people knowing, it kind of depends where the church family are up to. I mean, I think we, we know situations where there's actually not a lot of information circulating. And in order to keep the church family as one, they need a lot more information. And then there are other situations where actually it's appropriate to keep some things concealed because it's for the good of the, sh of the flock. But I think it boils down to that James Force of what's our motivation in all of this? Are we trying to genuinely care for one another and show love? Or is there that sort of agenda of self-protection and self-interest that might be defensive? Because that would be wrong in the church or in individuals or whatever relationships we're talking about. Yeah. Thank you. Well, pretty agonizingly, we have actually reached half past 10. And I'm under strict instructions that we must finish then. I'm sure lots of you have questions. Sonia's kindly said that you're able to be around for a few minutes. Yeah. Outside, please, just to keep it doubly COVID safe. Uh, if, if anybody would like to ask a, perhaps a more personal question, very much aware that some here today uh, will have painful, uh, deeply painful personal issues uh, and, and so on. I want to express our real thanks to you for uh, what you've helped us with today. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the, the log and the uh, spec, um, and um, you will have helped us in lots of different ways. So thank you very, very much indeed, Sonia, for that. Thank you. Thank you.